This episode of Mossback is presented by the Crosscut Festival. I think Aisho is the Northwest looking at itself mm. and then trying to project that self-image, distill that into something that's both commercial and spiritual mm -hmm. and then projecting that to the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all part and to ourselves, you know, it's, it's, it's defining us and using photography to do that on a scale that nobody else had done here. Hey everybody, welcome to Mossback, the official podcast of the Mossback's Northwest video series from KCTS9 and Crosscut. I'm Sarah Bernard. And I'm Knut Berger. And today we're talking about celebrated Seattle photographer Aishel Curtis, who isn't perhaps as celebrated as his older brother, the photographer Edward Curtis, but Aishel also produced an illuminating and incredibly prolific collection of images. He documented Seattle and the Pacific Northwest at a formative time from the 1890s through 1941. So that is the topic of the video, which, by the way, you really should watch. If you haven't already seen it, we suggest you stop right now, go to the show notes or the show page on crosscut.com and check it out. It was as if creative lightning had struck twice in the same family. Two men of incredible energy. I guess I'm curious, what, what kind of launched you on uh, on the the journey of sort of researching Aishel Curtis specifically? Why did, why did you make an episode on Aishel? It was actually suggested by uh, Stephen Haig. Oh, yeah. The producer, director of Mossbacks Northwest. And, you know, we were kicking around ideas for the new season. And... Um, and I, I thought, well, then, yeah, I, you know, I know who that is and I, I know the name and he's taken, a, you know, anybody who's done research on the Northwest, if you're looking for photographs, this is a name, Aishel Curtis, that pops up again and again and again. But um, there wasn't a particular, I wouldn't have said there was a particular signature to his works. They all, they mostly seem very, um, you know, very clear, very kind of objective, mm -hmm. you know. Here's a forest. Here's a street. Here's you know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, I, but I hadn't really thought much about him. But I certainly I'd read books about Edward Curtis. I I knew a little bit about them, them and their relationship. But it wasn't until I went to the Washington State Historical Society's digital collection, mm. and just searched for Aishel Curtis, and. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images are in that collection. And so I just started clicking on them and enlarging them so I could see them. And I was just blown away. You know, in, in, in the span of his career, he had just taken pictures of everything. And, and one of the things that really struck me was even if you took out all his Northwest work, and just looked at the pictures of Seattle. I mean, his career from the 1890s to the 1940s spanned, you know, 50 years of this amazing transformation that we went through mm -hmm. from this place that was still pretty much a frontier town in the 1890s to a modern city with skyscrapers by the 1940s. You know, it was like a short course in the history of urban change. Mm -hmm. So once I kind of went through that catalog, I just went back to Stephen and just said, you know, we got to do this. This is incredible. And then, of course, there's the interesting story about these two famous photographer brothers. Yeah. And yeah. how they did things so differently, but also kind of similarly. Edward is now considered an artist, a romantic, a man who is trying to record the beauty of a so-called vanishing race. He looks like a turn-of-the-century bohemian. His brother, Aishel, had a different style. He looked more like a bank clerk or an accountant. But he and his studio snapped an almost encyclopedic view of a region growing from a frontier wilderness into modernity. The family started in photography pretty much when uh, Edward Curtis and his father moved out to the Pacific Northwest. They had a farm over in Kitsap County, a homestead. And uh, Edward was got into photography and sort of set up 
had a setup and and eventually decided, you know, I'm just not cut out for farming. <laughs> so he went to Seattle and opened up a photo studio. And, of course, in the 1890s, in that era, this is when photography is proliferating. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's transforming so that um, there are more and more people doing photography. There's more demand for photography, portrait photography, mm-hmm. uh, that kind of thing. And... Um, and he was really kind of from the very beginning, um, you know, one of became very quickly sort of one of Seattle's very essential photographers. Aishel was the younger brother, and uh, so he, he left and became Edward's apprentice and worked in the photo studio. So they, they worked together uh, in that time period as, uh, as brothers. Yeah, in that way, I guess it makes sense. I mean, one brother becomes a photographer, the other happens to be interested and then learns from him, which, uh, I mean, photography, by the way, in the 1890s must have been such a different process. I only, I mean, I took like one class in high school where we actually worked with film and darkroom and stuff. I mean, that's sort of a dying art these days. It's 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 such a process and there's all these like strange chemicals. And it, Yeah, it's totally different. I uh, my father was a a professional medical photographer. Oh, really? And uh, he had a dark room at home, and one at his office, but he had one at home. And uh, when I was growing up, uh, he trained me how to um, make prints and you know put them in the fixer, the developer in the fixer, and all that. And so I was in this little unventilated room inhaling these chemicals. <laughs> Uh, you know, in my kind of early teens, but my grandfather, my my grandfather, and this is one of the things I related to in this story. My maternal grandfather was actually the first of my family to visit Seattle during the Alaskan Gold Rush on his way to the Klondike. Oh. so he came through in the uh, in the winter of eighteen ninety eight. And uh, he kept extensive diaries of his years. He was uh, up in up in the Klondike, Alaska, and in the northern British Columbia. And he did a bunch of different things in that time. But one of the things he did was he brought a camera, glass plates, and the chemicals. And so we have scores of his original glass plate negatives that he took of the gold rush. Wow. And... This gave me an appreciation for the kind of technology that the Curtises were working with, you know, yeah. with big cameras, big heavy tripods, glass plates, chemicals that, that you know, of course, um, you know, are, are very potent yeah. <laughs> by today's standards. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, I, when I thought about the kind of tools they were using, it just I could relate that to my grandfather's experience and and seeing what the challenges would be of taking these things into the field, mm-hmm. you know, setting them up in Seattle is one thing or having a studio is one thing, but going to Mount Rainier and carrying it up a mountain or going to Alaska and carrying it up the Chilkoot Trail, you know, these yeah. these are crazy things. A few years later, with gold strikes in the Yukon, Aishel went to the Klondike to document the ensuing gold rush in places like Skagway and Dawson and the trails the prospectors followed. Yeah, I mean, going, because they, they had to bring a lot of supplies with them. There was a lot of purposes. I mean, you, you, gold rush, they're probably, you know, <laughs> I don't know what kind of equipment they needed for that. But anyway, they got to bring that stuff. They got to bring their clothes and whatever. But they're camping, right? So they had to bring all the survival stuff and then... Oh, P.S., by the way, this huge amount, I mean, weight, probably it just weighs a lot and like glass plates, you know, I mean. Whoa. Exactly. It's like, how, how do you keep them from getting broken? Yeah. Once they're developed, how do you get them back without without them being scratched or what? I mean, just the just the logistics of that, let alone, as you say, I mean, there were rules about how much equipment each miner had to have. And they were literally, you know, you had to have a ton or two tons of equipment to get across into Canada from the United States, you know, because they didn't want people going out into the boonies and dying and starving or robbing people, you know, et cetera. And so they made this requirement, and that limited maybe the number of people could get through. But um, 
so people hired people to schlep that stuff for them. Okay. And my grandfather was one of those people. He was one of those people who were originally when he got to Alaska, he was working in building a road and f- f- um, sh- getting stuff over the mountains. Uh, so he had some experience, you know, he was in a position where he could, you know, lug stuff around. Oh, yeah. And so when your grandfather went um, with his camera, 1898, was that in the ballpark of when Aishel Curtis? Yes. Went up yeah. There? At the same time. He was same time. I think Aishel was up there a little earlier. He was up there in 1897. Um, 96, 97. I mean, the sort of the gold, you know, the gold discoveries that came out, um, the people in Alaska knew there was a gold rush going to happen earlier than when things, you know, hit the press here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But there were people who knew what was going on up there because Seattle and Alaska had a lot of, you know, communication. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Uh, Aishel Curtis was sent up there by Edward to photograph the gold rush, basically, in its early stages. And he produced, um, you know, some some really incredible images of what it was really like. You know, he wasn't up there to romanticize the gold rush. It was sort of like, you know, here are the challenges people are facing. Here's the here's people with sleds. Here's people with, uh, you know, mining for gold. I mean, it was a very kind of um, good, solid look at what uh, you would experience if you, like my grandfather, got on a on a, on a boat and you know went up to Skagway and what you might experience or Dawson. This ended up being extremely important experience because Aishel did a really good job. I mean, he took some really great images, and those were shipped back to his brother. Edward. And Edward, who it was his studio, and Edward um, got the wrote a story about the gold rush. And because he thought it would be great publicity for the city and for the gold rush, but also this, you know, kind of to get himself national recognition. Mm. So he got it in the Century magazine, which was like, you know, one of the the big deal magazines. And uh, he was credited with, uh, you know, story and photographs by Edward Curtis. Hmm. And this turned out to be an extremely important event in the life of both Aishel and Edward. Mm -hmm. You can sort of see why Aishel would be mad about that. I'm a little sister in my family. I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. And um, if my (laughs) sister ever took credit for something I did, oh, boy, like I'd be mad. But. But I wouldn't, you know, have a grudge my whole life. And it sounds like they that might have started this kind of lifelong separation. Apparently they didn't get along ever again. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, when this article came out, and, and Edward had written letters implying that he had been there and taken these photographs. But it, it was the credit that was undisputed. If it had said, for example, um, photographs by the studio of Edward Curtis, Mm -hmm. I mean, it was and it was the custom in the day for the person who was the 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 big fish photographer of a studio to claim everybody who took a a picture in that studio or on that studio's behalf. Oh, really? So um, and this is something that Aishel actually did later in in his career. Aishel Curtis didn't, you know, take every single Aishel Curtis credited photo. He had a people who assisted him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was the, there clearly had to be some kind of tension there before. Older brother, younger brother. The story goes, you know, that he came back, confronted his brother. Edward said, I, you know, had nothing to apologize for. And um, Aishel said, well, screw screw you, I'm out of here, and left Mm -hmm. to start his own career in photography separate from his brother. Mm -hmm. And certainly at some point they would, you know, the apprentice would go out on his own. Yeah. But But they didn't talk to each other for the rest of their lives, essentially, for another 40 years. Wow. They 
did barely communicated. And um, uh, Edward Curtis, when he was informed of Aishel's death in 1941, did not respond. Wow. Wow. Uh, no letter, no phone call, no, no visit. Wow. So it, it was a huge break. And there are different theories about the break, because I think everybody goes back to what you said. Would that rift between credit mm -hmm. really be a 40 year break? Mm -hmm. And I don't think, you know, I think most people have been thoughtful about it or talked to some of the descendants and whatnot. There's probably something more to it. Mm -hmm. Some family members have said that Aishel resented Edward's. Um, I mean, Edward sacrificed a lot to travel to remote places to photograph indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And he created this monumental 20 volume work of uh, North American native people. Mm -hmm. And that record, you know, may be controversial for different reasons today in terms of some of the things being staged or, you know, he had this kind of vanishing race, so-called view of indigenous people who weren't vanishing. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but but there was there was something that he was trying to capture before it disappeared in terms of lifestyle and and other things. And. um and he devoted his life to it. I mean, he was it it ruined him financially. I mean, he mm. he um you know, to complete this project, he devoted everything and so he he had to scramble for money. He got money from some wealthy people to kind of underwrite the series, but he had no copyright to the pictures. You know, um and he was kind of living hand to mouth. He was uh, he he for a time he lived in a room at the Rainier Club, oh, huh. in Seattle, and um, he paid for his room and board by giving them copies of the photographs. Oh. And so they have like this fabulous collection, which is on the walls of Edward Curtis stuff, because it literally was how he paid for being able to stay there, because he didn't have any money, but he had these pictures. Wow, and. You know, I think, I think, because of that, Edward was always gone, mm -hmm. and Aishel, I guess, I've read, sort of took on the role of kind of taking care of the family, mm. taking care of their mother, mm. as she aged and eventually died, and I think he resented Edward for kind of going off and doing all this stuff in remote places, being, you know. Mm -hmm off doing his thing and not sending money home or mm -hmm. even offering to help or be part of, of things. And so I think there was some resentment there. We'll be right back. Support for the Mossback podcast comes from the Crosscut Festival, happening online and in Seattle May 4th through the 7th. Join us in celebrating bold ideas for a changing world at our biggest event of the year, featuring fireside conversations, panels, live podcast recordings, workshops, and special events that explore forward thinking in politics, social justice, the environment, history, innovation, and more. Spend your week with the community of the curious at the Crosscut Festival this spring. More information at crosscut.com slash festival. In, in doing some research, I talked to Timothy Egan, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote a wonderful biography of Edward Curtis. And he's a good friend. And uh, I wanted to just get his sort of take on the relationship between uh, Edward and Aishel. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we talked about the, the kind of difference of their legacy, you know, because you had one person who's off with this vanishing race, uh, kind of almost photographing in the past mm -hmm. and photographing a very kind of romantic image of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and I put past in quotes there. Yeah. 
And then you have you have Aishel who's almost manically recording the present. Yeah. And recording, mm-hmm. you know, he did he did photograph indigenous people, but he photographed them doing what they were actually doing. You know, you mm-hmm. pictures of people picking hops, pictures of uh, the macaw hunting whales. But they're like action shots. It's yeah. like it isn't like an artistic pose. It's like Aishel's in the boat photographing someone harpooning a whale, you know. Mm-hmm. So they, there's this, this, uh, this real uh, difference there. But I don't, think, I don't think it was about the work. And when I was talking with Tim, he said that one thing that he heard but, you know, had not been able to verify was that it was, all, it was over a woman. Oh, there was another element involved in this rift that um, maybe gave it the the sting, and it's unclear who was in what side or who did what to whom or you know, what that is. It's not even clear if that is a definitive thing, hmm. but that might explain the intensity of the resentment and oh, yeah. and um, and how long that lasted. But there's another side to Aishel, which I, I think most people in the Northwest can relate to, mm-hmm. which is he was one of the founders of the Mountaineers. He photographed the natural world, the old growth forests of the Olympic Peninsula, the mountains, and glaciers, and the new class of men and women who were recreational adventurers like the Mountaineers. He was taking this camera equipment and going up mountains and taking really some of the first scenic photographs and using those photographs to promote the region. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible document of the whole beginning of outdoor recreation. Yeah. Right? This is, you know, here that's a a kind of a late 19th century thing. Mm -hmm. Right? This Mm -hmm. is when they're middle class people with leisure time who, you know, want to go to a campsite and there are people uh, driving on the very first road to Mount Rainier. Mm-hmm. He played a real role in getting Mount Rainier made a national park. So he wanted to preserve the environment, but that duality in his work of, you know, one day you're photographing these gorgeous old growth forests, and the next day you're photographing loggers chopping it down. Mm-hmm. And that they're presented as kind of things that can coexist mm-hmm. that there there's a morally equal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this is something I think we all still wrestle with right 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 this kind of dilemma because actually I, I I read up a little bit on Aishel Curtis's relationship with the Mountaineers um, and so he was a founding member you know he's a big part of this kind of growing group of people who are also making some early ascents apparently uh, I also learned through Googling that he um, he has a couple of glaciers named after him on Mount Shuxon because <laughs> he was one of the early, uh, you know, settlers to, to climb and document his climb, I guess, um, up to Mount Shuxon. Um, but it sounds like he had a falling out with the mountaineers, maybe in relationship to his, um, you know, promotion of road building and tourism as a sort of commercial effort in perhaps some conflict with how other people might have thought about conservation of the wilderness. I don't know if you know anything about that. You know, he fell out with some of the people who he had worked with to promote uh, Mount Rainier. Mm -hmm. And there were people who, uh, you know, wealthy business people who basically didn't want any tourism there. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted, I mean, they wanted the kind of low impact. And here was Aishel saying, well, we got this national park. Now we need roads. Now we need, uh, you know, we need to get people there. We need businesses. We need, you know, industry. Yeah. You know, he, and so he fell out with some of the, the wilderness preservation folks over this issue of commercialization. He's not just a passive pro-business guy. He is evangelical. Oh, really? I mean, he's giving speeches. He's talking to the legislature. He's giving testimony. He's writing letters. He was for 
an Olympic National Park, but he wanted it really limited because mm. he didn't want the loggers and anybody else to be put out of business or to be restricted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's the sort of con So he actually proposed that only the mountains you can see from Seattle would be protected and everything around them would be fine for settlement and resource exploitation. Wow. Right. And and of course, he he fell out with um, the advocates of Olympic National Park over that to some extent. So his advocacy kind of helped at one point, but then he really diverged from and, you know, the Roosevelt administration listened to the preservation folks and mm. and made the park way bigger than he than Aschel would have drawn it. He didn't like the New Deal. Hmm. Uh, didn't like Roosevelt. He was a rock-ribbed Republican. Hmm. Um, he didn't like the fact that Olympic National Park extended to the coast. Hmm. You know, he was strictly thinking about the mountains and, and that. And so <clears throat> it's interesting, too, because, you know, a lot of people are are criticizing and sort of discovering the sort of white privilege and white supremacism that was baked into a lot of the wilderness preservation movements. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, you had to be a white middle class person to belong to the Mountaineers. Mm. Right. You could yeah. be, a, they mm. took, there were women. So, you know, there were, you see a lot of great photos of early women c climbers and hikers and that kind of thing. But um, if people, uh, you know, were from the working class or of other races, they they had to go on their own or join a different club. Mm. Mm. Um, a lot of the desire to create these preserves was just inherently structurally such that only only very wealthy people could go to them. I mean, if you look at the lodges, mm. they were often built by the railroads, like Glacier Park. The Great Northern Railroad could go, you know, take a wealthy person from Chicago and drop them at the doorstep. Yeah. But is a, you know, is, a, a, you know, a black family from Seattle going to drive to Glacier National Park? You know, there, yeah. there's this kind of inherent segregation thing going on. And some people were explicit about it. You know, they saw the Mountaineers as in a white Anglo-Saxon organization. Hmm. And um, so there's just all kinds of of issues that we still have are mixed up in Aschel's work. Mm -hmm. It is a way to sort of see, I think, our dilemmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that things always don't neatly cross. You can, you know, somebody can advocate for a park but advocate too much. Uh -huh. Or they can advocate too little, or they can argue for a park, which is great, but they don't want anybody else to go there. Mm -hmm. And these things are still being argued by the Sierra Club and and by other organizations. Uh, oh yeah, about access and inherent kind of racism in the creation of this natural infrastructure, along with all the other <laughs> infrastructure. Exactly. And in some cases, some ongoing conflicts around, um, you know, tribal lands and people being, yeah, kind of shut out of some practices because of rules around national parks and this and this. You know, so it's all kinds of conflicts around around that. And then there's this argument to say, well, we need people to come and enjoy the wilderness because otherwise they won't want they won't care about it. And they won't want to preserve it. Right. So if you're just if you're just worried about the wildlife and the wilderness, then. Then we should encourage, you know, people to come enjoy it. But then do people come enjoy it too much? <laughs> and then do we destroy this very thing that we wanted to preserve? And so it's interesting that Aishel kind of documented all of that um, and that you can kind of look back through all those photographs and kind of see all of that um, going on, <laughs> that conflict sort of servicing in the images themselves almost. Yeah, I think about, <clears throat> I mean, if you think about his idea for Olympic National Park, uh, it it is a photographer's idea of preservation. Mm -hmm. I I I only mm -hmm. think we should preserve the mountains you can see from Seattle. <laughs> right, right. It's right. like I don't want to ruin the shot. Right. I don't. You know, <laughs> exactly. Don't ruin my shot. Exactly. Don't build a castle on top of the mountain, okay? Because it would just look different from Seattle. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks for listening to Mossback. This episode was produced by Seth Halloran, and the executive producer is Mark Baumgarten. Cover art by Greg Cohen. And many thanks to engineer Resty Bacall for building out an amazing COVID-friendly audio studio. If you'd like to check out more videos from the five seasons of Mossback's Northwest, you can find them all at crosscut.com or kcts9.org. For more on all things Mossback, go to crosscut.com slash Mossback. You can subscribe to the Mossback podcast wherever you listen. And if you like the show, please review us. It really helps other people find us. And if you'd like to support the work we do at Crosscut, go to crosscut.com slash membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, members receive complete access to KCTS9's on-demand programming and a subscription to the Mossback Den newsletter, where Knut shares even more Pacific Northwest history. Mossback is a product of Cascade Public Media. I'm Sarah Bernard, and we'll be back soon with another episode.